Morning. 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 Friday morning. Come on in. These are my volunteers. <laughs> Come and grab a seat. Um, as Terry said, my name is Nick, um, Nick Lotes. I've been doing collaboration now for about the last 20 years or so. It is my day job. I look after a team at KPMG we call You Collaborate. Um, and for us, collaboration is all about creating incredible experiences for our participants that really enable them to use critical thinking, creativity to solve some of their most complex problems, um, have some fun along the way, but also make decisions right, um, about the prioritization. And collaboration is important because if you get it right, you can build that alignment and ownership in, thank you, um, in the work they're doing. So this is something that we use with our clients. This is something we use internally. Um, and it's something that actually I, I genuinely believe in. As I say, I've been doing this for the last 20 years. Um, Katie's part of uh, our team. Um, and when we talk about different ways of working and um, we build for those collaboration, we draw upon all of those different skills. Come on in, make yourself home. Um, what I was going to do this morning was um, really, uh, I guess, a game in three, three halves. Can you have three halves? Of course you can. Game in three <laughs> halves. Um, the first bit really was just to just get a little sense check or about collaboration. Because it's one of those words that everyone says, collaboration's important, we have to collaborate. Right? Um, but not many people really understand what collaboration means or they just go, actually, if I get people in a room, I'm collaborating. Or if I send someone an email, I'm collaborating. So I'd love just to get a sense across the room of when we hear the word collaboration, what do we think? Okay. Then what I do is I want to introduce a little bit of chaos um, into the system. So we're going to run through a very, very short, fast exercise, um, which I will then use to unpack some of the tools, some of the mindsets, some of the thinking we have when we design our collaborative experiences. Okay, so you get a chance to experience, it's probably one of my favorite exercises. It will be a little bit chaotic. I apologize for that. I don't really. Um, it's a little bit of fun on a Friday morning, um, but it may just mess the room up a little bit. Terry, I'm sorry. Do it. Um, do it. <laughs> um, and then take you through, once we've done that exercise, take you through some of the tools, some of the models, some of the thinking um, that we use. Um, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not a lecturer on collaboration. I am a facilitator. I can talk about it for days, um, but what I want to try and do is get some questions from you folks to make sure we're making it really as relevant as we can. Okay, so I don't want to talk at you for 90 minutes. When Terry said you had 90 minutes, it was like, yeah, can I talk for 90 minutes? <laughs> Quite possibly, but I don't want it. So, um, with that in mind, if I can make this clicker work, they won't let me touch the screens. Keep touching them. Yeah. Not working. Is it no. I don't know. Oh. It's a fail from the start. <laughs> there we go. So, just a, a little map, right? And I'll come back to this diagram because when we design our agendas for days, we design them in blocks, and there's a pattern language that sits behind the agenda that means we can communicate agendas with people. Um, for us, time is elastic. Um, we don't often share agendas with people when we're designing collaborative experiences, and we certainly don't normally share times with people because in some cultures, some organizations, people look at an agenda and work out the bit that they think is important and just turn up for that bit. Okay, so we don't normally share an agenda. We don't normally share times on them, but just to give you an idea, just gonna start here, collaboration is a word. We're gonna do the exercise, and then we're gonna talk about collaboration by design. And that by design for us is really, really important. Everything we do is we slow down, we prosecute the why behind everything, and we work out by design, what's the appropriate response? Right? We talk about creating the future by design and not by default. All too often things are done by default. Just because it worked last time, we assume it's gonna work this time. Okay, so by design is really, really important. Oh. There we go. <laughs> Look at this. Oh, thank you. So collaboration, just a word. I've got, I've got two sides um, on the screen. There's a side over here when you look at Wikipedia. Um, it just pains me because it says collaboration is similar to cooperation. That, that hurts. Um, I don't think it is. Um, but what about when some folks in the room, when you hear the word collaboration or someone says we need to collaborate, what strikes you about that word? It's overused. Overused, yep. A lot like the innovation word. It's, yep, overused. What else? I guess it's a joint product at the end of it. A joint product at the end of it, yeah, yeah. I often talk about creating shared objectives, 
um, because organisations, different teams within organisations, they all have their own agendas, their own objectives. Okay, and that's important because this bit around here that talks about the blind spot in collaboration says if you don't hit those shared objectives, then it's going to fail. Right? Because what you really want to do is get to a point where you move down the conversational intelligence layers to get to the point where you go, here's my objective, here's your objective, we can create our objective, and then we can collaborate for success around those. What else? Lack of self-interest. Lack of self-interest. Yep, yep. There's almost, and it's back to that shared objective point. It's around actually, you know, there's something about humans, uh, which is quite fun. If you allow them to have their say, they can back something. It's a really interesting process if you watch people go through it. If you don't allow them to have their say, then they will fight something. But actually, if you've listened to me, you've allowed me to have my say, if we've had the conversation and you now understand why I don't necessarily agree with you, I can support you. Right? And it's not consensus. I, that's another word I dislike. Um, so if you go through today and you talk about consensus, I might wince or grimace. Consensus means the lowest common denominator that we can agree to, which is unhelpful. Okay? What we want to do is get for the best, most powerful solution we can get to, which might mean we have to argue about it. But how do we build those skills and capabilities that allow us to argue? Okay. Any other observations or comments around the word collaboration? Inclusive. Inclusive, yes. There's this wonderful thing about how you never know where great ideas are going to come from. Right, we see here, I've been doing this for 20 years, so clearly I know and I have all the best ideas about everything to do with collaboration. Sadly, I don't. Right? So if you can build those environments that are inclusive, that are diverse and have leadership, which creates the permission for people to move forward, then you can certainly move forwards and find some magical ideas that not, you know, I may not have come up with. Any other comments before we move on? Do you want to come and take the stage? <laughs> I can sit down. My work is done. My work is done. Thank you. Um, so I think that's really, really helpful. Thank you. And, and it's important because there's a large part of our work, and certainly the way we work as a team, is in the world of improvisation, right? so, which is that open mind. Someone will give you something, and you have to work out what you do with it. And no is not often a good answer or a helpful answer because people go, oh, you're always saying no, and you, they will back off. So there's creating that culture, creating that way of going yes and no but. Yes, we could do that and we could do this, or no, we're not going to do that, but we could do this. So it keeps that conversation alive. Okay, so um, I think this, this is for me is important, collaboration by design. There's no one answer for collaboration, but what you've got to do is build your toolkit, build your capabilities, actually make some conscious decisions about how you set people up for success in collaboration. And what you're really trying to do is, I love this, the work that Judith Glasser did on conversational intelligence. Um, is really go, actually level one conversation in her world is a straightforward information exchange. Right? How many meetings do you go to where someone will just tell someone some information and then someone else will tell them another piece of information? And it's just, I'm going to tell you something, Mel, you're then going to tell me something, those sorts of things. And actually in some of those instances, people aren't even listening, they're just waiting to speak. Right? Um, so really you've got to move beyond that way of thinking. You then get into that persuading side of things, right? So I've got an idea, it's a really good idea, so I'm gonna try and position it, um, which again is unhelpful. So what you really wanna to get to the point is when you can be co-creative, which is that point of those shared agendas uh, that you can move forwards. Does that make sense? Good, right, so to start off, we're gonna do a little bit of an exercise. This is that sort of edge of chaos type stuff. Um, I don't know if this is gonna work or not gonna work, but it's gonna work, because you guys are gonna be brilliant. <laughs> What we've got is a series of envelopes. Kate, can you give me a hand here? I'm gonna hand these envelopes out, okay? And what I want you to do is to get in groups of threes, fours, or fives, whatever really works for you. Maybe people you don't really work with. In each one of these envelopes, there's a challenge, okay? It's an A3 piece of paper. There we go, Alison. There we go, just if you'd like to take some and pass them on. Yeah, go on then, thank you. Just, just hand them out. There's an A3 sheet of paper in there, and on the top of the sheet of paper, you'll see a challenge. You've had just about eight minutes to do what we would often call the impossible challenge. Okay, some of the challenges that were out there were things like design a better toaster. Right, I love toast. Toasters haven't really changed over the many years. Um, who had toaster? Right, so lots of people worked on toasters. There was another one out there that was about designing a bicycle. Bicycles, again, haven't really changed over the years. Who had the bicycle? 
They haven't really changed over the years, two triangles. That's, that's kind of pretty much a bike. Um, some of the other challenges were things like a machine that puts you, uh, or put a man on the, or a person on the moon for the price of a stamp. Have you had that one? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was things like uh, the ultimate lift, right? Yep, someone possibly had that. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, there was another one out there that controlled the weather. So there's one of the one or two of those in there. Yeah, <laughs> we shall see. Um, and I think there was another one that was really that enabled you to be two places at once, right? which, which I trust someone solved because I could really do with that one. So um, we've got lots of different views of the truth, and there are lots of different um, you know, impossible challenges. But in eight minutes, I'm guessing that each of your teams has solved that problem. So congratulations. <laughs> now this is where the real chaos comes in. Okay, because what I want you to do is to find the team that had the same challenge as you, right? Not yet. You guys move fast. Not yet. But I want you to find the team that had the same challenge as you. So all those toaster teams, you need to find each other. And then you've got about a minute to pitch your idea and convince the others that it is that wonderful idea, <laughs> right? Once we've gone through all of them, what we want is each of the teams to come forward with one of those teams with their best idea and we're here from those seven ideas out there, each one of those great ideas, okay? This is a sure exercise again, so probably in about 10 minutes time, I want the best answer from each of the teams. Now, as you go through this, if you can see a better answer by adding your idea to someone else's idea, then please do that, okay? That's, that's it's not necessarily a competition, but we are all competitive, but it's about getting the best solution we can. So in about 10 minutes time, I'd love one person from each of the teams to be up here and we will just quickly go through um, how you solve the problem. Okay, does that make sense? So, find the cohort that had the same challenge as you, go through your mini pitches, work out which one's the best, and then come and stand at the front. There's something about putting energy in the room that we just now need to take it back, and I can have the energy. Thank you. Now. What we did there, um, a short exercise to, uh, I guess, get the blood flowing on a Friday morning, get those creative juices flowing. We put in the room, I think there was about seven of these, we often call them impossible challenges or ultimate designs. As I said before, they are some of those things that people go, that's just impossible, you can't do that. But we gave you eight minutes to solve it, right? Um, and pretty much everyone, I think, solved it. And then we said, right, within 10 minutes, work out uh, which one you want to put forwards or how you want to collaborate to create your idea. What we're now going to do is just a very, very quick spin through just to see where we got through. Any IP lawyers in the room? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Keep your pens away. <laughs> the, the intent here, just very, very quickly go through each of the ideas and just go, right, you know, tell us which idea you had. So if you had the toaster, we had the toaster. These are the key features. Here's our artwork and this is the relevance to collaboration. So it's probably less than a minute each. Okay, so do you want to start down this end? Which design did you have? We had the ultimate mousetrap. The ultimate um, mousetrap. So our key, um, our key words were that we wanted to be humane and we wanted a catch and release system. Um, one of the other groups talked about, um, well, we looked at, at different consumer markets as well. So we were also looking at farmers. Farmers don't necessarily want to release their, um, their mice. They want to more kind of <laughs> so, um, so in conjunction with this system, which is effectively a lure the mouse in, give it a little day spa to hang out, and then chill it out a little bit physically so that it drains itself of energy and then we can release it either into our less humane um, neutralisation system, <laughs> which would involve um, a biodegradable um, new home
because our first target is going to be the Amazon, to save the Amazon. Um, and we've trademarked it as well. Um, so what we have is, we have a dome. Up here, we have the clouds, so you can create your clouds. Sorry, you probably can't see this at all. Um, so you can create clouds, you can have no clouds, you can make it rain. Um, so that was our initial idea. And then when we collaborated with the other group, then we came along because what we had created was a roving weather controller. So based on the idea of a snow plow and snow maker, our design um, has a lot of nifty features. Um, we've got a scoop up the front that can scoop up the clouds that allow the sun's rays in. We've got, it can also suck up methane gas, um, pour out oxygen. We've got some weather guns. Um, and we've got a helpful banner that flies around to encourage people down um, on the ground to promote a healthy, <laughs> climate conscious um, awareness raising activities. And so this is when we collaborated and we came together, we decided we'll take our little roving snow maker flying weather controller and put it inside the dome. <laughs> Guys, uh, we had the design the ultimate toaster. So again, in these pictures, it's always great to have a visual. So because we've not got a lot of time, can you pull out your phones? <laughs> Go to Twitter for me. Look up at Warwick McLean. <laughs> W-A-R-R-I-C-K, and you'll get a visual on our toaster, which is really, really important. Okay, so. Um, we had designed the ultimate toaster, and we kind of thought outside the square, we thought commercially, we thought big bang, we thought wow, and I think collaborating with the other teams, we actually ended up with a much better toaster than what we had originally thought. So in terms of some of the key features of this toaster, and you'll see as you look it up on Twitter, um, that this toaster does it all. It butters your bread, it removes the crumbs via right, the vacuum at the bottom of the toaster. It actually produces your coffee at the same time as you are toasting your bread, your uh, croissant, whatever it happens to be. Um, it automatically pops up and pops on your plate and it will determine that if you're not nearby, there is a drone attached to this particular toast. <laughs> and that drone will deliver your toast wherever you are. Um, now, because it's also making your coffee at the same time, it's also storing the butter, so it's able to put the butter on, uh, put your spreads on. Uh, and also, uh, because it's great to have something cooling at the same time, and sometimes you do like toast at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, it's also providing a, a cooling spot for your wine. So, <laughs> it can be used 24 hours, this particular toaster. Um, I think uh, one of the key features, two of the key design elements of this particular toaster is that it actually removes carbs. <laughs> and we're currently working on a project to remove gluten, so <laughs> uh, um, a couple of uh, collaborative uh, contributions from all the teams. It's uh, it's solar, so it's sustainable. It's transportable, so you can take it camping with you. Um, it uh, auto detects the type of bread that you've got in the toaster, so it'll auto automatically brown it. Um, it's see-through. One of the annoying things with toast is that you just don't know what's going on. Um, uh, it auto molds. So again, whatever you put in the toaster sometimes can be different. Um, and it wafts the smell of toast throughout your home. <laughs> and I think uh, two of the key things that it, it does, it never burns. And you can turn it on its side to uh, toast that cheese. Guys, the <laughs> ultimate toaster. <laughs> Ideas and a, and a drawing down here. 
Yeah, so we, actually all four of us had really different designs, but we liked elements from everyone's. Um, I think probably the winners for our um, team's design was that it had a wine and a coffee holder. Um, and it also and had... we've trademarked this first. <laughs> <laughs> that drops down because nobody likes hat hair or helmet hair and it actually gives you a blow away. <laughs> um, also has a motor which we're, we're verging onto the car. Yeah. <laughs> Something we had in common was the driverless bike yeah. Yeah. option. Yeah. We want to make it optional right? You guys wanted to make it optional. Yeah we want to make it optional. Sometimes you might want to actually do the pedal. And uh, we also thought of a tracking device, which I'm also thinking, you know, it's got to have blockchain capability. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? You know? Blockchain capability. <laughs> um, and also, we, also, something we all thought of was uh, um, the, the cover, the rain cover, obviously, you know, being protected from the elements, and we thought we could double that with a storage component, so you could have the cover lift up, you could put your stuff in, and it could Okay, thanks, Eve. Oh, well, one, one more, more really one key more. feature. A <laughs> couple more. Storing black is really hard, so this is what ours looks like when it's packed up. Two teams came up with things like, let's just print a stamp and put the face of a, you know, someone on the moon. We'll <laughs> design a machine that actually prints stamps, um, you know, so you've got the price of a stamp. The other two teams went, started with rubber bands and slingshots. <laughs> uh, and then um, uh, some sort of a form of a mnemonic tube that sucks, beam me up Scotty style to the, to the moon. We sort of ended up with other designs like, let's just design a hologram machine so we can actually Put a holographic image of someone on the moon and then when the four of us all got together we came up with something completely different but we used elements from every single one of those designs i think that was part of the thing for us of uh, how the collaboration improved what we ended up with so what we came up with in the end after all of those different sort of ideas was kind of like an instagram booth where there was a holographic image of the moon and the camera then would have you in front of it with the holographic image behind it Still trying to work out how to weave the little band into it. So, you know, one of the ways was maybe pull a rubber band, and that was the trigger to take a photo <laughs> of you um, on the moon, and then it prints you out. You want to stand. <laughs> Have someone that um, uh, we have to be in two places at once, 
and there's a representative that does that, how would um, you know how would we power a machine like this? Um, what would be the ethical um, considerations that we have to look at? Um, how would we audit? How would we um, control? What would happen if this um, device um, doesn't work? What if it malfunctions? How are we going to regulate it and make sure what can they act? Where in what places can we be in two places at once? Where is that the right thing to do and where not? And um, how do you um, if, if you are being represented by a machine? Um, um, how will you control it to make sure it doesn't go rogue? <laughs> <laughs> rogue right, two places at once. Mm -hmm. Sounds fun. <laughs> Thank you. ultimate lift uh, and it was really interesting when we all came together because people had come at it from different ways which is what a lot of collaboration is all about so it was fantastic to build on those ideas. One team had actually decided that the ultimate lift wasn't a lift in terms of a physical lift but more in terms of an emotional lift. So we looked at that side of things. Um, another team had looked at the idea of using your mind to control the lift or a lift anything. Another team had said what about um, uh, actually um, having more control over the journey in the lift so you can re regulate it that way and the other team talked about having a portable lift so you can take it and bolt it onto where you might want to use it or someone else can use it when you're not using it and it's a more sustainable type of lift. So what we came up with was lift for the day, lift for a day. So you go into the lift and it actually senses your mood and works out what you need for the day. So if you, you get down and you need a bit of a pump up, then it might play you some rocky music or something like that and get you ready for the day or it might um, allow you to um, play with your pet or have a coffee or do something that allows you to have that sense of having an emotional lift. Uh, and the other part of it is that you can override that if you need to. So if your thought is, I just want to be on holiday, um, but in fact you need to go to work, it will then get you ready for the day to go to work to be more serious and that type of thing as well. But you can take it to different places that you need to take it. <laughs> Thank you for playing. Um, one of the things that we do um, in our world when we design collaboration is as a facilitator, we don't normally do the work at the front of the room. So many of you will have been to workshops where you have a facilitator, that facilitator is at the front of the room writing down all the words. What we try and do is we try and get you folks, our participants, to do a lot of the work. Um, it's not so I can go and drink coffee and do those things. What we're looking for is your brilliant ideas, your words, your drawings, your icons, um, not my translation of those. Also, when you leave those sort of, uh, you leave to take those ideas forwards, there's a different level of ownership. If you've physically written on the piece of paper, if you've physically written on the whiteboard or the flip chart, it's a different level of ownership. And that's what we're trying to seek as we go through all of this. So I'm just going to go through a few slides which talk about some of the frameworks we use, some of the models we use, some of the ways that we think that enable us to design those exercises, but then pull in lots of different exercises to create an agenda. And we often think about our agendas, our workshops, and in our world they run from 90 minutes all the way up to three days and beyond, we think about them like a roller coaster ride. Okay, so what are the highs, what are the lows as we go through those? Now, interestingly, about my methodology, my way of working, it really is about collaboration. So people say, Nick, is it design thinking? Is it agile? Is it lean? It's all of those, right? And actually, it really just says, whatever way you want to work, let's just make sure we design with the end in mind and we want to enable the conditions where we can collaborate and we can work together. So that's important. If you look at the way some people um, tackled that exercise there and the way they responded to some of those challenges, there was just so many reframes. You know, it's a lift. How do we interpret a lift? How do we reframe that? What's the real problem? What's the real opportunity? That's classic design thinking, right? But it's working in a way that's a little bit more collaborative. Was it an enjoyable exercise? Yeah. Yep, yeah, great. And we didn't break the room too much, so uh, there's not much sort of rearranging we need to do. So I'm going to click through some slides. Um, elements of facilitation. So for us, we, we're a team of facilitators um, and facilitation is the way that we get people to collaborate or enable people to collaborate. For us, we go back to the origin of the word facilitation, which means to make things flow. And our job is to design that ride that actually makes it flow and makes it easy for people to do the really, really hard work they need to do. Okay, so this morning's exercise was very, very playful. 
Um, some people come to me and they go, Nick, can you tell me some energizers? Some people <laughs> might refer to that exercise as an energizer, but it's not an energizer. We will always use that exercise by design and we'll angle the questions on that piece of paper to really allow our participants to answer the big question they're trying to grapple with. And some of them will give you elements of a solution. Sometimes people use it to tell you what's really going on in the system. There's a way of listening and when you're in those report outs as you share back that helps us to do this. So our design framework says, at the very beginning, we need to design with the end in mind. So the leadership alignment is really, really important, right? Sitting down with people before you go into a collaborative session to say, what is, what's the outcome you're really looking for? What does good look like at the end of that session? Okay, that's really important that you that sort of right to left thinking, work out what it is you're designing for. Sounds obvious, but a lot of times we just go into rooms and people say, I need one of these and you go, okay, I'm gonna do that. What we're looking for is we're looking for the twist, the point of complexity that means actually you don't just need a normal workshop, you don't just need a normal conversation, you need something a little more sophisticated. So where's the point of complexity? That's what we're looking for as we go through this. And then there's a number of elements that we play across. So one is co-design. Co-design is really, really important. You saw it on that list of conversational intelligence, how you get to that level three where you can co-design. So we co-design that journey that we're, uh, that, that we're designing for that collaboration for, but equally we get our participants to co-design work. So if you think about the exercise you just went through, it really is a big co-design exercise because you're working with people that you know, people that you don't necessarily know, people that are from your industry, people that are not from your industry, right, in, in kind of that, those sessions. And you're looking to create those, I guess those trans-contextual linkages Right? Often we solve a problem just through one lens. Right? It might be, and I, I don't have a legal background, but it might be just we're going to solve it through a legal background. What if you bring other contexts into that conversation and look at it a little bit differently? We all operate within systems. So that's important to design and co-design across those systems. You're working really, I guess, in that systems theory kind of space. So co-design is really important. Environment. People think about facilitators, they think about people at the front of the room, um, that's gonna, you know, I've got a pen, I've got a flip chart, I'm going to tell you exactly what we're going to do and you're going to get you to my idea. There are many different levers as facilitators when you're designing collaboration, when you're designing workshops that you can use and environment is one of the biggest. Right? There's a saying that you can't change people, but if you change the environment you put people in, you can change their performance. Right? And you think about how if you walk into a library, you sort of walk in and you, you, kind of, you, you, you go quiet. Right, if you walk into a, a church, you might just humble and quiet and slow down. Um, if you look at the way that banks and courts used to have steps that you walk up to them, that was to slow you down walking into the building. Right? So there's a cues and environments that trigger it. So we were running a, a, a really collaborative session. I was talking to Kate as we were planning for this session, going, we're going to have a theatre style room. And we didn't know we had fixed chairs or it was going to be terraced or, or what it was. We didn't really know the environment we were in and we didn't have a lot of control. Or we chose not to have a lot of control over the environment. Right? So we just trusted our process. But imagine how we could have redesigned the environment that made it so much easier for you to do that exercise. Okay? Now part of the fun this morning was chaos. Um, yeah, it's a little bit how do we get groups together because there's not perfect numbers of rows in the chairs and the way you choose to sit. Um, you might be sat with your friends and we may actually want you to work with other people. When we want to get you out of your chairs into other groups, where are you going to go? Right, so it's a little bit self-organizing chaos. So think long and hard about what you can do to the environment to change those behaviors. Right, the obvious example of all of these, which is a real default example, but is a boardroom. Right, almost every boardroom is the same. Right, it's a different artwork on the wall, different wallpaper, but it's got a big table. It's the iconic status of a boardroom. A table is a barrier. It's unhelpful to actually collaborate. It's unhelpful to work. And we want boards to work. And we want them to have really, really difficult conversations. Um, is a table the right thing in that room? It may have been 100 years ago, but is it today? But there's a default behavior that goes through those. So really, really think about environment. Content. Often we, you know, nowadays our heads are full of facts and you know, myths and legends that we get off the internet um, and off Twitter feeds with toasters and all of those different things, right? So there's lots of different information sources available to us. But where's the single source of the truth? Okay, so design with content in mind that you give people the facts you want them to base their information on. You don't want to really set yourself up to have a thorny conversation about something 
might be about you know the cost of running your organization you don't know whether it's 100 million or 200 million or something like that or somewhere in between have the facts in the room so you can design for those to bring those into the conversations excuse me and facilitation so i talk a lot about facilitation so i'm a front of the room facilitator um, we use environment to facilitate we use assignments to facilitate when we get people in breakouts when you're in those little like clusters you didn't have a facilitator in those rooms right what you had was an exercise an assignment right that piece of paper was your facilitator um, we use graphical facilitation so a lot of the work that kate does helps us to drive engagement drive behavior through um, graphical facilitation the way that people will connect with something tell the story um, through that so there are so many different levers of facilitation acoustic facilitation okay you often when you're working or you go to a workshop someone will be playing music if they're really really good the music will drive your energy if they're really bad the music will be a distraction and often what people do is they just play their favorite songs um, and that's often bad because you can catch the lyrics you know, you might not match the music to the style of the people that are in the room. Actually, if you think about true creativity, true creativity needs the alpha brainwaves. Okay, you can play mathematical classical music that will stimulate those alpha brainwaves. So by really designing your music, designing that acoustic facilitation, you can shift the performance of the people in the room. Okay, or you can just play your favorite song. It's a, it's a conscious decision, right? And sometimes just any song is going to be good but other times think about that, that music, uh, that you can do that. It's also a great way, you know when I was shouting, going, can we sit down please? Music's a great lever to actually stop the conversations because you can just turn the volume up and up and up until you can not talk to each other anymore. And you can train people over the course of, of sort of a day um, to move and quieten down and get louder on musical cues. So it's another facilitation lever that you've got there. And the last thing is people. Um, in the elements of facilitation. I've never found a nice way to say this, but we always think about people last. We always think about people last. Because once we've framed the conversation, the problem that we want to solve, or that we want to design for, we can then work out who do we need in the room. So we don't often start, we've got this group of people, what are we going to do with them? We go, we've got this problem, who are the right people to help us solve it? Okay, so we, we think about those last. Any comments or questions? Is this, is this helpful? Am I answering the questions as you're coming in with? I was wondering what do you do with people who are participating in this process but who aren't um, engaging with the process? Oh, this is a great question. It's a great question. Um, so we use many, many different techniques that try and engage or enable people to engage in their own personal styles. Um, so we design work when we're all together in groups like this, we design work that people can do individually, we design work that people can do in groups. Okay, we use visual, we use auditory, um, so lots and lots of different design cues. Often what we find at the very beginning of a session, someone will sit there and go, oh, consulting crap, right? <laughs> Something like that. At the end of sessions, nearly always what they turn around and go, that's good, I know what you did now. Um, so there's an element of we have to help them create that safe space, um, but help them on that journey. Um, and um, they, they normally do find it. I think in my career, I've had about one or two people that have gone, this really isn't for me. Um, but it's an element of trust the process, um, but we have to create that safe space and recognize that everybody's different. We all have our slight nuances to the way that we think. So how do we design the right environment, the right exercises, the right way that enables people to be successful? Because ultimately what we want to do, is anyone do agile? Yeah. One of the elements of Agile is make your clients and your people awesome. Right? That's one of the principles of Agile and that's what we want to do. We want people to feel good about the work they've done. Is that a vague answer? Or, yep. There's no, there's no brilliant answer. The, 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 real, the real thing you have to be is present and you have to spot it. Um, there's a wonderful line comes from a book um, that says, from the vagueness of nuance we create fact. Right? And if you look at humans, humans are full of nuance. In our faces, there's so many little cues that we do that says, I'm understanding what you're saying, I don't get to what you're saying, I'm threatened by what you're saying, I'm relaxed and I'm comfortable. And if you can spot and you can be present, those nuances, that it just makes you stronger. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Um, effectively, uh, this is all about making sure, if you remember nothing else from this, about getting the right people with the right content in the right environment, giving them the right work to do so you've designed the right work and the right level of facilitation. Often you'll see organisations go, I'm going to build a lab. Um, and they put people into the lab and people work the way they've always worked. 
you don't have a process that helps people to think and work differently as you go through that. Um, we do have lots and lots of patterns to the way w that we work, so it really is about designing that journey. But it's as simple as right people, right environment, right content, right work, and right process to enable them to, to get that work done. Sounds really, really easy. Um, and hopefully it is if you apply conscious decision to your process. Don't do it by default. Right, so some of the tools and models and methods that we use to help us be successful. So I'm gonna share some models. These ones that I'm sharing today, they come from a, a capability called MG Taylor, so Matt and Gail Taylor. Um, they designed these models a uh, good few years ago, actually, but they've stood the test of time. Actually, they help us to really understand you know, what is it about humans and how do humans work. So the first one I've put up on the screen is called a creative process model. And this aims to mimic the behaviors of creative geniuses. Uh, so mere mortals like me, I have to look at people and go, how are you so successful? How do you consistently deliver what it is you're looking to deliver, right? Or achieve what you're looking to achieve. Some of those explorers out there that do magnificent things. Um, this model, starts at the top with an identity, right? Every organization has an identity as a reason it exists, right? It exists for a specific purpose. And so designing and working within that identity is really important, right? Sometimes organizations want to pivot or shift from that, but understanding that, recognizing that's important. But once you've got your identity, you work out what are the things that you want to do differently, okay? And they often manifest themselves as visions, right? Now, visions is something you can co-create or a vision might be that somebody locks himself away in a room and says, I've got a brilliant idea. Right. Now, once you've got a vision, almost all organizations um, that I've worked with go from, or before I've worked with them, go vision straight across to engineering. Right. So we know our vision, we know what it is we're shooting for, but what we're gonna do is start building some plans. Right. We're gonna start making some decisions and we're gonna start building some plans. Once they've got those plans, they give it to a team to go away and build it who implement it and our users go, it's brilliant, what is it? You've solved the wrong problem. There's a whole bunch of unintended consequences that sit around it, right? It might be a process that takes longer. It might be a system that just doesn't gel well with people. It might actually be you know, a building or a road or something that's just in the wrong place in a, in a, in a kind of a city sort of context, right? The two steps that organizations often miss and particularly in the world of transformation is building intent and insight, right? And these are, these are human things. Intent is that belief, that ruthless focus that I know why we're doing this. I'm excited by it, you've got me. I can enter that state of flow. Um, this is really, really important, I understand it, right? I believe, right? That's what we're trying to build and you can build that at an individual level and you can build it at an organization level. If you think back to some of the projects or pieces of work I'm sure you've been involved in, some have been really easy. You've really enjoyed working with the people around them. You've worked those extra hours that have been required to hit those dates and you've done it with a smile on your face. You do that because you've got intent behind the project. Okay, you don't have fear, you're not grimacing, you know, you're not fighting every single hour you're doing. If you can build intent, you can then build insight. And insight is that aha moment. Now I get it. Now I know why we're having this conversation. Now I know why we're saying the things we're going to say. Now I know what's in it for me. Now I know what's in it for my team. Now I know why we're doing those decisions. Okay, so we really encourage people, and certainly through the collaboration phases, to slow down. We've got a vision. Unpack that vision. Get people excited. Get people to believe in that vision. Allow people to have their say, such that even if they don't necessarily believe in it at the beginning, they can support it. Okay, so that intent stage is really, really important, followed by moving on to that insight. So a lot of the work we do is helping organizations through that piece. Does that make sense? Yeah, any questions before I move on to the next one? I often use this as like the lid of a jigsaw box. So one of the first conversations I have with people when I'm trying to solve it is I explain this model and they go, oh yeah, we haven't even got a vision. Right, so now I know what conversation we're having. Right, um, or they go, we need a plan, we need a whole bunch of solutions. Right, well help me to understand your vision that I can take your people on this journey so we can then engineer what the solution is. Okay, so that's like a level zero sort of model. The next one is, uh, you can add this one, you can add these models together, they get really quite sophisticated, but this is a way of thinking through your organization and thinking about what you truly are designing for and designing in that whole system context. Okay, um, this is a model, it's called Vantage Points, it's another MG Taylor model. 
Um, but it starts down here with task logistics and tactics. Most organizations do change at a task logistics and tactics level. We need a new timesheet recording system, right? That's a, like a, it's a task, right? Um, so we can give the logistics, we can give that system to our people and it's probably tactically, it's not gonna be our strategy to just do a time recording system, but they just do that. They don't necessarily think about that in the context of their strategy, right? Or organizations will go strategy down through tactics, logistics, and tasks. What we encourage people to do and you design for the conversations that when you're building your solutions is to think across all seven of these layers. So not only think about your strategy, but think about the implications on your policies because your policies are one of the ultimate drivers of the behaviors of people in your organization. But we tend to drive our policies you know, outside of our strategies and we don't often have a strategy like linked back to our policies, but the policies drive behaviors of people. So policy might be the, you know, it might be our uh, recruitment policy, the type of people that we're recruiting. A policy might be one of those uh, regulation policies that actually helps us to be compliant conduct as we go through this. We change our strategy, do we have to change our policies? To execute our strategy successfully, do we have to change the way or enable the way that our people need to perform? Okay, so, that, sort of, so just that mindset of going, let's consider everything. Some of these things we may or may not have to change, but we know we've considered them. You then get out to culture, um, and a lot of people talk about culture, um, uh, but we go beyond culture into philosophy. In all of the organizations you work in, there's a gut reaction of an answer to a question or the way things get done around here that's a little bit more deep-rooted than culture. right? Um, and that's important to have those conversations, because if you're changing something that's not in the context of that, then again, it might just be hard to get that change or that transformation through the system. Okay, so these models, sometimes they're like a conscience. Do I need to change something in philosophy? Maybe not, but I've considered it. But if I know it's right, then I can think about the implications on culture, our policies, our strategies, our um, tactics, logistics, and tasks. So it gives us a completeness of thought when we're designing work. Okay. Any questions? I know I'm going through these quickly. Um, you can spend years just reading one of these models. Um, they're fascinating. I don't know if you can answer this question, but um, have, you, have these types of concepts um, ever been applied in the legal industry? Yes, yeah, ab absolutely. So the uh, question was, have these sorts of concepts ever been applied in the legal industry? Um, absolutely. Um, I've done work with some law firms um, in, my, in my past um, around those. Um, it often is, which is why leadership is at the be very beginning of that uh, framework for facilitation and collaboration is that we need the leadership to go, we're going to have this conversation and we need permission to have that conversation. And once we've got that, people have some fun and do the work. So you think about the exercise we did this morning. Um, sometimes when I'm describing this exercise, they go, you're never going to get our CEO to do that. Right? Okay. Yes, we will. Yeah, we'll have some fun. So what are some examples of some of the legal issues that have been addressed by this type of collaboration and design? Yeah, so, so in my context, it's more around sort of operating models within organizations or strategies for the corporations as opposed to specific legal issues. So if that makes sense. So if you do that, if you take that lens on it, then actually the only thing that's different really are the people, right? So you have a machinery uh, that has a whole bunch of processes, it has systems in it, and it's got people in it. So in many ways, it's no different from any of the other firms. Um, and one of the challenges you often find is, you know, organizations go, we're unique. There's no one else like us around that. And those unique organizations are few and far between, actually. Um, and when you start really unpacking them, you go, well, actually, 80% of you is the same as many other organizations. Right? You've all got to do payroll. You've all got to do those, those sorts of things. So it's a bit of an overarching question. Um, I'm sure I can find in, uh, examples in time where people have used this to, to really, really think you know, very differently about some of the constructs that we've had. We've used these, actually, in a, in a procurement process once, um, this is a previous life back in the UK, um, the organisation, we were putting a tender in for uh, a big outsourcing contract. Um, this is my pre-KPMG days. Um, and um, effectively, uh, these are multi-year, big, multi-million dollar contracts. And what we did was with the legal team, we used these sorts of frameworks to enable them to say yes to all the schedules. So the philosophy of the deal we were doing with the client we were looking to work with, well, our philosophy was we're going to say yes. And so the markup of the schedules where we go, we can't do that, we're not going to do that. Never in my watch 
type comments on the schedules, but actually using the model to go, and it was other models we used, but philosophically to win this piece of work, we're going to say yes. And we're going to work out in our organisation how we say yes to all of those. So you know, lots and lots of thorny conversations about what does saying yes really mean? And then unpacking, well, what does that really mean and what are the consequences and implications of that? Does that help? Yep. Okay. Um, do you have any sort of must-read references or authors that you'd suggest if we were looking to read a bit more about this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, there's, uh, Wrong person to ask that sort of question. <laughs> I was thinking about 15 years. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, no, I could, I could uh, if, you, if you reach out to me, I happily share reading lists on this sort of stuff. Um, but there's a, there's a brilliant book uh, that was written by a couple of folks here in Australia um, called Collaboration by Design. So Charles Collingwood Boots and Philippe Kloom, which unpacks a lot of this in a really, really usable how-to kind of manner, right? But then you can really get into um, Nora Bateson. Um, she's in Australia towards the end of um, August, Gregory Bateson's daughter. Um, he's been studying systems theory. He's got a beautiful book, Smaller Arcs of Larger Circles. Um, so there's so many different references, and I've, I've sent Ali lists many times. Um, I'm sure Kate's smiling over there because we often refer to books. Um, okay, so just moving on. This is a, this is a really deceptively simple model. Right? It's, again, it's another MG Taylor model. I thought I'd use the selection of their models for, for today. Uh, but this is the way that humans work right? in pretty much most of the things we do. If we think about lunch, we're going for lunch, what we do is we slow down and go, what are all the options that are around me for lunch? Right? And that's that scanning phase where you're really looking at what are all the things that sit around me. Okay? And then you make a decision. I might go for sushi. Uh, which sushi bar will I go to? And then you act. Okay? So three stages to this model that says, let's start at the beginning. We're going to scan. We're going to slow down, we're going to learn some stuff. Uh, and that can be stuff about a project, a program, an organization, industry, um, or it can be really, really, really broad. We sometimes play in the space of metaphors. Um, so teach people about really different topics than that, that, that they're actually focusing to do. So if you're doing a big transformation program, you know, getting people to study bees and ants is really interesting because they learn all about communication and patterns and behaviors and hierarchy. Right? So there's a way in that scan phase to slow down and give people truly good information that creates that high performing team, creates a common language um, and gives them some newness, introduces some new context so they don't just solve the problem with their existing thinking. Because right? if we try and solve some of the complex problems in the same paradigm they were created, we're going to end up with the same solution. So what's the information you can put in that shifts people's paradigm? Focus really then, so that scan, and there's little feedback loops from all of these, but focus then really says, well, let's play with the problem. Now we know the options that are open to us. We understand the art of the possible. Let's shift now and start creating the things that are actually probable in our world. We talk about creativity is the art of eliminating options. Okay, often now what we do when we design products and services and apps and systems, we love to design features in. Look at that toaster. How many features has that got? Right, going back to the toaster. But if you actually think about that toaster, what you can do is you can start to eliminate some of those options. Right? The world of architecture says a building is complete when you can take nothing else away from it. Right? It's complete when you can take nothing else away from it. And that's what our system should be like. That's what our processes should be like. That's what our procedures should be like. It's as much about what you design out as what you design in. So focus allows you to play with that. And then ACT really says, right, now let's roll our sleeves up. We know really what the work is we need to do. We've played with the problem. We've scanned really, really broadly. We can now make some really good decisions and move forward with that, with that ownership, with that alignment, with that buy-in around the way forwards. This is a non-linear journey. Um, often when people design agendas, they go, right, yeah, we're halfway through the work, halfway through the time, we've done half of the work. For us, all of the work gets done in this ACT phase. But it's like getting a plane down a runway. It starts really, really, really slow, a little bit cumbersome. But then it picks up speed, picks up momentum, and gets that point of rotation. The act is that point of rotation. You have to go through pulling that bow back, creating that tension, creating that frustration to enable people to move forwards. So really, really simple model. But what we do is we design our agendas to go, actually, we're going to tell you all of the information you need up front. Okay, how many times have you been in a workshop Someone's asked you a question, you've answered the question, they then give you a new piece of information that's changed the way you would have answered that question beforehand. 
yeah, one or two nods and smiles. So by giving everyone that information, you set them up for success first, okay? And this is, this is just something that we don't do, and this is just really about slowing down and enabling uh, people to understand why you're slowing down. Often people go, um, we're gonna do the, we have to solve this problem. You know, um, I had a client come to me once that said, I need an implementation plan. Right, it's great, I love plans, really love plans. We do really big plans that you know, we sometimes do them on the floor, you can walk through. So I thought this is brilliant, we can do plans. One of my colleagues asked them, why do we need a plan? Surely you've got a plan. And in that twist of asking why, they found out that the relationship that was working across the system to implement this new system was all broken. So it wasn't about an implementation plan, the conversation they really wanted to have was around how do they fix the relationship, right, and set themselves up for success. So it's a twist. So we don't slow down and ask why, we will often solve the wrong problem, right? Um, but once we've got why, we then think about how we're going to solve that problem. Okay, now most people in this room, I'm sure almost everyone in this room will say, I can write an agenda. Right? That's how we're going to do work. So we know what the conversation is, we know how we're going to do the work. But what we do is we really start to encourage people to design what work are people going to do? Right? What toolkit are you going to give people? What environment are you going to put people in to do that work? What piece of paper are you going to give to do that work? What whiteboards do you have? What technology do you have? Um, what pens are you going to give people to write on that piece of paper? Right? So we can think about all of those different levels to give you the toolkit to enable you to do the work in the best possible way you can. So you think about the exercise we went through this morning. We didn't give too much thought to the environment. We knew what we were walking into. And we're using it as an example just to say, imagine if you changed the environment, how you could change the way that exercise worked. We knew we were giving you paper. Um, we thought it would be good fun rather than just hand out sheets of paper to put it in an envelope. The element of surprise, there's something fun about what have I got in my envelope. We didn't think about pens, so we gave you pens. Some of you use Sharpies, some of you use Twitter, some of you use Biros. And you think about when you're standing up here, I can read a Sharpie, I can be directed to Twitter and look at that picture. Can't really read a Biro. Right? When you think about writing on a piece of paper, there's just a piece of paper with nothing to lean on. So you can think about all of those different levels of tools that you can give people to enable them as the, yeah, that what work we get, or sorry, what we're gonna do to do the work, if that makes sense. And the three Ps then is when you're giving instructions, when you're facilitating around that, when you're setting people up for success to do the collaboration, help them understand um, the purpose of the exercise. So we're gonna do this exercise and the purpose of this exercise is, because okay, that guides people into the exercise. Then you can tell them the process. The process that we're going to go through is this, which helps them to be successful as they go through that exercise. And then you can tell them the payoff. Okay, so purpose, process, and payoff. This is why we've done the exercise, what the exercise enables us to do. And if you do that, then people who engage in those exercises in a different way. Sometimes we're given things to do, and it's in that space of energizers, that people are just playing with people for the sake of playing with people because they think it's fun. It might be an over-exaggeration, but some of those energizers people would get you to do, you kind of go, why are we doing this? If you can understand the payoff to it, you go, ah, now I get it. I'm gonna engage with it in a different way, okay? And then I'm almost at the end. You can buy books, you can buy cards, flashcards, and all of those things that have got exercises that you can run in workshops, right? We have a big toolkit of exercises we've been designing and delivering over the years. But one of the things when we're thinking about collaboration by design is that exercise may not exist. Right? Someone may come to you with a unique problem, with a unique characteristics, with a unique set of people that you've never seen before. And every exercise you try and pull out of your kit bag is just the wrong exercise. But actually, as smart, creative people, we can design, this is all of us smart, creative people, we know we're creative, look at the exercises you've done and your thought processes around those exercises. We can design the exercises we need to get us to the outcome we want to do. So if you break up one of those exercises and you think about that exercise this morning, there's basically five stages through it, right? So what's the task we wanted you to do? Right, the task was to solve an impossible challenge, right? Um, why did we want to give you that task? So a couple of reasons. One, people say they're not creative. How often do you hear that in organisations? We're not creative. Look at your artwork, look at the way you solve the problems. We're a room full of creatives. 
right? So how do you enable people to be creative? But also if you look at that exercise from a, a workshop process, if we were going to go on and do work, there's a number of head fakes in that exercise. So head fakes where you think you're doing one thing, but really you're doing another thing. That exercise showed us how we could work together. Right? Actually how we could communicate, how we could respect each other, and how we could co-create something, right? It taught us that actually we're gonna be using bits of paper to synthesize down our ideas. Right? It taught us a pattern of, we're gonna have conversations and we're gonna bring those conversations together, but then someone's gonna present. And it taught us how to present in this environment. So when you're thinking about those tasks, there can be little meta levels that sit underneath that task through the exercise, because everything speaks, everything builds up to the outcome you're looking for. Input. Is there an input to the, the round of work? Is it just a piece of paper? Is it the piece of paper, the pen? Is it some of that content that I mentioned earlier on that you're giving people? So task plus input. And then the challenge. What do you want people to do? Right, that can be a creative challenge. Thanks, Terry. Um, that can be a creative challenge. That can be a, a really, really uh, scenario-based challenge. You know, you've got half the amount of time to do whatever it is you want to do. But think about the challenge that you throw into the room. And then the process. How do you want people to process that challenge? And then finally complete it. So in that exercise we did, the completion was those mini pitches to each other, um, and then effectively that pitch back to, to different people. A report out, in our world we call them report outs. Um, makes sense. So you can go through and design um, those, any of the exercises you want. And then finally, really about, you know, I talked about facilitation, different levels of facilitation, um, elements of facilitation. So spoken facilitation, um, it's kind of someone like me, someone like you at the front of a room, helping people to be successful, guiding people in what they want to do. Written facilitation can be a facilitator in a breakout room. When there's only one of you, write the exercises, get brilliant questions, put them in the breakout room. You can then have multiple facilitators driving work because that piece of paper, those questions, become your facilitator. Visual facilitation, so the graphics that you can create, the imagery that helps to reinforce your story um, that you're trying to get to can be really, really helpful. Education, so what's the way that you can help people to learn through the process? What's the new context you can give them? How do you get people to learn information that enables them to be successful? Space is that environment element to it. Um, please don't underestimate the power of space. Just play with it when you get back to your offices. Move the chairs, talk to facilities, get the table out. Break some of those rules. It's not going to get you into too much trouble. Um, and then um, acoustic, yeah, that sort of music style facilitation. I think that's pretty much what I was going to cover. Yeah. So collaboration for us. It's creating those collaborative experiences. It's designing that journey for people. It's enabling people to use critical thinking and creativity to solve things that they thought were pretty much impossible. If we asked you this morning, you know, can you design a machine that puts a person on the moon for the price of a stamp, you probably would have gone, no. Um, and you have, right? If you said about toast, you had toast for breakfast this morning. I love toast. Um, you know, design that ultimate toast to look at the ideas that we've got out there. So that's really what we do. Um, and I hopefully you've taken something away from that um, that helps you in the design and understand the importance of collaborative experiences. I guess any questions before we close and finish? Is everyone asleep? <laughs> Coffee time. Was it useful? Yes. Yeah. Good. Um, I'm around for the day, so if you catch me uh, in between sessions, if you've got any questions, please feel free to reach out, LinkedIn, shoot me an email or something like that. I'd like to say I love talking about this stuff, so thank you very much.